Good morning, Rock of Grace. Boy, we have some late arriving Pentecostals this morning. Would you stand up with us? so worthy, isn't he, church? He's so worthy of all of our praise. Can we just lift up our hands in his presence together? God, we worship you. Remember what we talked about a few weeks ago, about that authority you have. You have the authority right now. You have the choice to focus on the lie of the enemy or the truth of his word. Child prays for peace on earth, and she is 
calling from a sea of hurt. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And can you hear the battle in the room? Can we all lift our hands right towards Jessica right here in the front? I feel like God wants to encourage you this morning. And I feel like you represent like an army of women and you've been bearing like the weight of a bunch of women on your shoulders. And you're feeling this weight and it's been hard for you even, uh, even to lift your voice and sing. And I want you to realize something. Is there any other women in this room that have been feeling overwhelmed the last week? Would you just lift up your hand like you've been feeling the crazy weight of the world on you? There's like 30 women raising their hands right now. You're not alone. You're not alone. And the Lord says, he has big plans for you. He has good plans for you. And this is a good thing, not a bad thing. He says, don't overthink it. 
just worship. Don't overthink it. Just worship. Because your worship, whether you feel like you have a voice to be on stage or not, your worship can impact not only your household, but regions around you and women who are lost in things and you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders and the enemy tries to get you to focus and say, see, you can't sing, you can't break through. And the truth is you can't on your own, but with the power of the Holy Spirit in you, can we just reach our hands towards her right now and speak joy, just say joy over her. Joy over Jesse right now. Joy over Jessica right now. The walls of condemnation can come down now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and I speak joy and overflowing blessed anointing over you our sister right now come on join together no more tears and no more pain I see joy is coming joy is coming Catches your tears. Yes, and amen. Worship you, Jesus. And to every other person in here that she was bearing that weight of. You see, Jess, you're an inter intercessor and you don't even realize it. You bear the weight of others. And that's a high calling. God's called you to not carry it, but to give it right to Him. So everybody else that's been bearing that weight, can we just lift, instead of reaching our hands this way, can we just go like this? And let's just set our gaze on the king. Come on, set your gaze on the king. I am lifted up, worthy of all praise. I am place church isn't he good isn't he good this morning I prophesy the goodness of God over this house this morning and I speak the joy of the Lord over you today he turns your mourning to dancing he turns your sorrow to joy. Come on, close your eyes. Close your eyes and start worshiping. I just feel like, I know, I know we should probably just go into the next song, but I feel this, the Lord saying, wait and focus on me this morning. Come on, be the worship leader over your, your home, over your household right now. Tell him that he's holy. Tell him that he's worthy.
angels all around they're singing holy there are angels all around they're singing holy right now there's angels all around the room and they're just singing holy they're not worrying about the battle right now they're not worrying about the storm that's coming they're not worried about finances they're not worried about anything they're just singing holy 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 oh change the atmosphere now They're singing holy.
chorus again. So let there be light. Let your presence come. Let there be light. Ha! 
their flocks by night to see this baby wrapped in light and a host of angels led them all to you it was just as the angels said you'll find him in a manger bed he made you up and saved hallelujah 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 a star shone bright up I know you came to rescue me This baby boy would grow to be a man And one day die for me and you My sins would drive the nails in church the light of the world is here he's with us today last night as I was praying about what to say today I don't know about you but God uses simple things to speak to me I was changing a light bulb at the house And the Holy Spirit said to me, Jesus is the light of the world. But because of that deposit of the Holy Spirit in each one of us, we are the light of the world. And as we look around, our world gets darker. We need to shine that light. As I was replacing that light bulb, I thought, When I was called into the ministry, I said, God, I don't know if I could do this. 
I was like Moses. I'm not a man of many words. But God said, just open your mouth. And when I opened my mouth, that light bulb was a 60-watt bulb. But the more I opened my mouth, that light turned into a three-way bulb. It turned to 75 watts and then 100 watts. In church, the more we open our mouths and send that gospel out into this dark world, God will use it. Don't let the enemy talk you out of it. We can all be used of God. And through this season, what better time to speak the word to somebody about Jesus than to the time of his birth. And he also reminded me that he's soon coming. We want to get the word out. So you bow with me. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning, Lord. We thank you for your presence here, your Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you for Jesus that came. He was born to die on our behalf. And because of that, Lord, we can have that intimate relationship with you again. And that we could spend eternity with you. Lord, your wish is that none should perish, but all would come to repentance. Make that our heart's desire today, Lord. We just thank you again for your presence here today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. We're going to have a couple minute intermission. Uh, something else I wanted to say that I don't think this was Holy Spirit led, but uh, how many pastors does it take to change a light bulb? Well, three, but the light bulb's really got to change. Want to change. You catch that, Will? It's really got to want to change. So let's greet somebody you, didn't, you don't know and tell them you are the light of the world. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Rock of Grace. My name is Ruth, and we are so happy that you're here to worship with us today. I have a few things I want to tell you about. If you're new to Rock of Grace, you can, um, well, it's right on the screen. You can fill out a Connect card in the seat back in front of you, and if you hold on to that Connect card, bring it to the green wall, which is out those double doors after service. The pastors would love to meet you. Or you can text new at ROG. 
The other thing I want to tell you about is tonight is Immerse Night. 6.30, we'll be here to worship. It's going to be a great time with other local churches, and we get to worship together. Just a reminder, there is no child care, but we want you to bring your kids and have them come worship together with us. The next thing I want to tell you about is there is a young adults party this Thursday night at the Hopkins house. So if you go to events at rockofgrace.org, you can sign up for that, and I really encourage young adults to do that. The next thing I want to tell you about is we have a chance to bless extra foster kids in the system this year. We had already collected cards. We had done the gift card. Um, if we can get 17 more cards, every child in the state of Ohio will have a gift. So I want to encourage you to get a Christmas card, write a note in it, get a $25 gift card, bring it to church next Sunday, and we will, don't put a name on it, just make it a blank card with no name on the outside, and we'll be able to bless some extra foster kids this year. So I really want to encourage you to do that. The last thing I want to remind you about is Christmas Eve. We have two services. It'll be at 9 and 11, and it's a shorter service than a normal service, but we want you to bring your kids too because there is no child care, but this way you can all worship together on Christmas Eve and share in that joyous time. Pastor Jordan? Give Ruth a hand. Many of you know her as our hospitality director, so, but she's also our, our administrator, so she's doing a great job um, helping keep a lot of ducks in a row and all kinds of things like that. Are you guys excited to be in God's house today? Man, I, there's, sometimes I'm just playing guitar and I'm just like, God is so good. I look around like you guys, people just worshiping in God's house, like, I don't know, there's just nothing better, Amen. <clears throat> Well, let's uh, receive our offering. The ushers can, can come forward. As, as you know, you can um, drop it in the box on the way out or in, in the bins as they come by, but also online. And uh, we're excited for what God's going to do. And how many of you guys believe that when we give our, our finances, that's just another expression of worship? Amen. It's just like giving your best at work. It's just like uh, singing to the Lord. It, there's all kinds of ways that we worship God. And in our finances is just one of those ways. So, Father, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to glorify you uh, with our tithes and offerings. God, thank you, um, Lord, just for the miracles, Lord, that have taken place financially in just the last week, Lord. Uh, we're, we're so thankful, God, even for the, the Compassion Fund gifts we were able to give this week. God, I thank you for the faithfulness of your people and that you provide, Lord. The, the book of Acts, Lord, describes this amazing family uh, experience where no one was in need, and we thank you for that. We thank you that we get to live in that that amazing atmosphere, that amazing family. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, "Amen." Amen. Um, I do want to just real quick mention, you know, because of your faithfulness, we we're able to express some compassion um, to to some um, single moms and and ladies this month. It's really awesome uh, to know that they're not stressed over their needs being met when something goes haywire at the house. Amen. So it's really cool. So I, I just, yeah, it's awesome. All right, open your Bibles up <clears throat> if you have them to Matthew chapter uh, 7. And that's the passage that we opened with last week. This is a sermon series that um, I've called The Fullness of Time. And in November, um, early November when I was praying about what, what was this, because this was, this was the one series we didn't have a name for yet. And um, in time, or in prayer, I felt like I could just see God's stopwatch or, you know, his clock saying in the fullness of time. And so we mentioned that verse last week from Galatians that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, that God's timing really is perfect. And I want to, I want to tell you today that the truth, we're talking about Jesus being the truth. Okay. Last week we said that verse, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And that summarizes our entire month, the way, the truth, and the life. Today, we're talking about him being the truth, Jesus, the truth. Can you guys just say that with me? Jesus, the truth. One more time. Jesus, the truth. Okay? The truth of Jesus is objective and remains eternal. The truth of Jesus is objective and remains eternal. I want to start with that premise because we live in a very chaotic world, a very confused world, um, I would even say a very dark world, where everybody's truth is subjective to their feelings, 
how they woke up that day, even their upbringing, right? Their social cues, what was constructed for them, nature, nurture, what they experienced as a child. But what I want you to know, this I'm going to come back to this idea throughout the, the morning, is that the truth of Jesus is objective and remains eternal. Okay? How many of you guys have ever heard the phrase... Well, that's my truth. Have you ever seen that on, on TV or in a show or even someone uh, maybe at the office? Maybe you're in a, in a conversation with someone and they're not seeing your point of view and maybe they might say, well, that's just my truth. While there is perspective, of course, there is only one objective truth. So today's world, what we find is even a lot of people deconstructing their faith. We've had a lot of uh, even famous, if you will, for lack of a better word, uh, pastors and, and artists, whether it's Michael Gunger or whoever, um, even go on TED Talks, right, and talk about deconstructing their faith because their truth is their truth. And often what is presented is the, the message of relativism. So I alluded to this last week, but I want to really hit, hit the hammer today of what is relativism, all right? So I know this month is going to feel a little bit like seminary. So turn to your friend, turn to your neighbor or your spouse or a random person you've never seen and say, buckle up. All right, because what we want to do is we want to not only stand, understand what we believe, we want to understand why. Amen? And, and I want you, as, as your pastor, I want you to be able to explain why you believe what you believe and why truth is truth to that friend or that coworker or that person that you're inviting to Christmas and they're like, I'm not a religious person. Okay, so what are the lies of relativism? All right? The lies of relativism is that there's no objective truth. In fact, a lot of teenagers graduate high school. They're in a great youth group. All right? Did you know even, even it's in the high 60% of even Assemblies of God teenagers, when they go off to college, universities, they're told these ideas. There's no objective truth. That the world is too big for there to be objective truth. Number two, that my feelings determine what truth is. And number three, that morality is subject to the person. Okay? So let's talk about some of these things. Where it goes wrong. Where it goes wrong is on its first glance. Because if, if you were to talk with someone and you're at the coffee station with them at work. And they said, well, how can you know what truth is? Right? Like, there is no objective truth. What you want to do in that moment is ask them, is that objectively true? <laughs> that there is no objective truth, because even on its statement, it contradicts itself. Number two is when someone is harmed. How many of you are parents? Okay, just let me ask first, how many of you are parents? Okay, first of all, I'm praying for you. Okay, like I have five, it feels like 500. Um, and how many of you guys have ever had like, you know, maybe, maybe someone does something wrong to your child or your child uh, does something wrong to another. How many have filled out an incident report at the daycare? I will not sh share with you how many I filled out. But the idea is that the, the daycare can't tell me, you know, hey, Lucas pushed him down, and you put him in a headlock, and then he body slammed. I added the last part. But he did this and that, and I can't be like, well, that's my truth. You know, it's, it's okay that you feel that that was inappropriate. I don't feel that it was inappropriate. How do you think she would respond She'd be like, I'll give you my truth, right? <laughs> we have rules at the daycare. Well, why is there rules? Because there's an objective sense in all of us that harming someone isn't right. And so what's ironic, and, and again, this is, I'm, I'm trying to help you in case you're a guest today or in case you're watching online and you're still skeptical to the whole idea of faith, or maybe you're a Christian, but you don't know what to say to that friend that you're trying to lead to Christ, why there is a truth, why there is a God. This is a very easy one. This is, this is a tee the ball up, okay, and hit it out of the park. Because if morality is subjective, when your kid is stolen from or hurt, now you have no, no moral basis to claim any harm. Why? Well, then, there is, is, there a good and, is there a good and evil? Is there a right and wrong? Well, of course there is. It's set in all of us. Everybody put your hand right here in your stomach, all right? Some people call it conscious. Philosophers call it their conscious. Um, you, know, you know right here in your subconscious, in your gut, if something's right or wrong. 
How many of you guys have seen the, let me just make it very real. How many of you guys have seen the clips of like Target being looted in the last two years, right? I don't even know how Target's still in business. They're looted every day. But anyway, how many of you guys have seen these clips? All right, just me and Carrie. Anybody else? Anybody? Okay, all right. How, how many, do you know, do you know right away that that's wrong? You know right away. Why? The Ten Commandments are right here. Isn't that interesting? God, 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 when he designed us, even if you have the nature nurture problem, even if you grow up in something that, you know, harm and, 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 all, and all that is, is okay, you still have this gut feeling of what's right and wrong. And so the relative person... Always, if you talk with them long enough, they'll come to the place where they're like, yeah, I, I can't expect to say that murder, theft, rape, that any of these things are wrong. And I can't even put them on a scale. Of, co of course, rape is worse. Of course, murder is worse. Well, why do you know that? Right. Because there's a good and the evil. Amen. So how about this one? Those who believe relativism are doing so ultimately because they don't want to be subjective to a law giver. Okay, so he, I want you to hear this. And uh, I was reading, uh, a lot of times I just study and read logos, read the, read the word and, and write. And this sermon series, I did a lot of reading. Tim Keller, one of my favorite, he actually just passed away recently. Him and John Piper, a book called Think, both pointed out this great point. If your coworker or your neighbor says, well, that's good for you, faith is good for you. Have you guys ever had anybody say that to you or at least imply that? Well, that's good for you. I'm just, I'm not a religious person. Well, let's talk about why, why is it that you are aversive to this idea of there being a God? Now, you don't want to come out swinging with this, but if, if, if their heart is open and you're talking over a meal, at some point you can get to this idea of, well, I believe we're going to stand before this God who is a lawgiver, and that one day we'll all give an account. You see, here's the point. Relativism cloaks itself in humility. Relativism says, I'm not so arrogant to think I can know God. You see, I'm humble enough to know that there are multiple views in the world. Does everybody tracking with me? Uh, relativism cloaks itself in humility and says, I, little old me can never know an objective truth. But what you have to understand is relative only looks like humility, but it's pride. Because what it's saying is, I don't want to be held accountable to a supreme authority. Does that make sense? Okay. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read the verse that we read last week. And we're going to talk about the exclusivity, if that's how you say that word, of Jesus. Enter by the narrow gate, he said. The gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are rare. I said this a few years ago from the pulpit, and I saw people cringe because it, it, it feels funny to be heard. But when the, the road to destruction is wide because sin is fun. Sin is fun for a very short season. If sin wasn't fun, people wouldn't sin. <laughs> Can we state the obvious? You guys okay with being honest? Turn to your neighbor and ask him right now. You, you're going to be honest, right? You're going to be real with yourself, right? I mean, why come to church if we're not honest? Okay. The reason the gate, the, the way to destruction is wide. Because again, people don't want to be held accountable to this idea of a supreme authority. But the road to salvation is Christ, and that gate is narrow. There's one way. Right? As we said last week, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That he, he is the only way to the Father. Now, again, the, the universalist and the agnostic and the person who believes in relativism all will say that you're arrogant for thinking that. And I've had people tell me this. I, I remember having a person tell me this in Chicago. I was trying to win to Christ. And this guy, even though uh, he, did, he didn't, perceive, he didn't uh, portray this on the outside, 
But then when you talk to him, he was really a deep thinker, totally like a philosopher. And he would always come at me with this, like, well, that's really arrogant for you to think that you have the only way. You see that? But what you have to understand is those who have found Jesus, okay, are not thinking in, a, in an arrogant way that we found something that you can't. We're grateful that we found the only way. Does that make sense? So what am I saying? God loves us enough to tell us to repent of our sins because our sins separate us from him. Our sins separate us from a holy God. Now you say, well, how do you know what sin is? Let me say it like this. Ever-changing truth. If I say this is my truth, if I show up to the daycare and he says, hey, Lucas put Timmy in a headlock, and I'd be like, well, that's Lucas's truth. How y'all think that's going to roll over? Like, she'd be like, well, my truth is you can no longer come here. That's my truth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? Right? Because the rules provide safety. My friend, my friend Tim, this is a little spontaneous, so hopefully this, this illustration works out, was an air traffic controller. If, he, if he's on the call and the pilot says, hey, I'm coming in, and Tim says, you're not coming in, if that pilot says, well, this is my truth, I'm arriving at 3.03, <laughs> Tim's going to say, well, your truth is you're going to crash and burn to the other plan that's arriving at 3.02, Right? There's rules for a reason. How many of us as parents have said that phrase? There's rules for a reason. Well, God has rules for a reason. He loves you. He loves you. I need you to hear that. He loves you so much. Turn to your neighbor and say, he loves you. What is all this pointing to? God makes sense. I love that about Tim Keller's preaching. He he uh, helped a lot of uh, doctors and lawyers and really brilliant people realize that God makes sense. Amen? Number two, refusing God's truth leads to rejecting God's gift. So it's not that this is this intellectual height and that one day you can be smart enough to know God. No, the gift of Jesus is received by the eight-year-old, right, and, this, and the CFO. The gift, it's a gift. Everybody say gift. The sooner we admit our need for this gift, for Jesus to forgive us of our sins, the better. And when we don't admit that, again, what we're, what we're saying is, I refuse to believe there's a truth I'm held accountable to. John chapter 8, Jesus said this. Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and you guys probably know the rest of this, and the truth will set you. I mean, you, you hear that line even in Hallmark movies, okay? By the way, does any of your kids watch Hallmark movies? By the way, I just, I just want to give a sincere apology for every businessman that's stuck in an office and is about to have their wife taken away by a guy in a flannel at an apple orchard because <laughs> it's all the same movie <laughs> every year. 32 minutes in, I'm like, there's the guy in the flannel. Huh? Oh, the light bulb. Oh, oh, you fell into my arms. Oh, now we're kissing. Okay. <laughs> so stupid. Every year. And my girls ask me to watch this crap. I mean, this stuff. Sorry. And delete that. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm not watching this again. It's the same movie. Okay, anyway. Like, can I get an amen from all the men, please? Help me out. Come on. It's like somebody put on Jaws or Terminator or something. I need something to blow up. <laughs> this, this relationship, I need this to blow up right now. No, I'm just kidding. All right, I better get focused. All right, John 17. That was a long rabbit trail, and I sincerely apologize. John 17. It's okay. Thank you, brother. John 17. They know that everything you've given me, Jesus said, is from you. I've given them your words that you gave me. So Jesus is having this interaction with the Father, and we get to listen in. This is so cool. 
I've given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. Do you know Jesus prays for you? One of, one of the words I comfort uh, people with when I'm, I'm calling them or visiting them and they're going through something is because this, this idea really, people sometimes don't think about it. I say, do you know Jesus is praying for you in the midst of your heartache right now? Like, what? Yeah, there's a few times in Scripture where it says Jesus is praying for you. That's remarkable. Look at this. Skip down to verse 14. I've given them your word. Ever say word. The world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just like I am not of the world. This is amazing that Jesus identifies you, Jessica, he identifies you with himself. Think about that. Tim, it's not just that he says, I, I don't belong here and I'm going somewhere. He says, you don't belong here and you're going somewhere. That's amazing. This is, this is why you feel uncomfortable in this world sometimes. How many of you guys ever feel uncomfortable? You look around, you're like, what? You believe what? Right? The reason for that, Jesus explains. So he says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I'm sending them. For their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified. By the way, if you're in church, and well, you're in church now, but if you're in church and, and weeks and months go by, right, you should be, you should be sanctified. You should, feel, you should feel convicted. Like, I, I want to feel convicted at church. Like, because if I go to a church, right, and the pastor only affirms all my feelings for three months straight. That, that's probably not a church. That's some great TED Talks, okay? But in church, we should expect to be, what, sanctified. How many of you guys like that feel? I actually like the feeling when the Holy Spirit's like, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a solid two-by-four over the back of it. You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, God, why you got to say it like that? Why you got to hit me right like that? But it tells me that he loves me, according to 1 John. Right? He loves me. He sanctifies me. What is it that sanctifies us in truth? Because we're talking about Jesus being the truth. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. The word of God. Guys, if you don't know what to do in life, open the Bible. If you say, uh, man, I need advice for this difficult situation, open the Bible. You say, I have a relationship, I have a relative that I, I can't seem to recognize. Open the Bible. Watch the Holy Spirit guide you to the exact verse. Okay? Amen? <laughs> I just had a funny story under my mind, but I will not tell it. Well, now I will because I laughed out loud. I was telling the kids about open the Bible, and this kid comes up to me after service. He's like, I was reading in Judges, and this woman put a tent peg through the guy's head. And I'm like, don't apply that. Just don't. Youth pastoring was interesting. All right. Do you love the truth? That's my next question for you is, do you love the truth? Okay? Turn to 2 Thessalonians, verse 2. Do you love the truth? Again, the lie of relativism is cloaked in humility. I'm just a mere human. I can't know God. I can't know objective truth. No. It's humble to say that the truth of the universe loved me enough and got on my level and called me by name. You see that, men? We need to make sure we understand it and can articulate that. Look at verse 3. Let no one deceive you. For that day will not come unless rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness, we talked about this last month about in our end time series, is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he can take his seat. Now, why am I connecting this to you? Let me pause. You say, why on earth would you read a verse about the man of lawlessness in his Christmas series about truth? Here's why. The, tr the, the problem with relativism, and John Piper pointed this out, which I love this, is he said this. 
it sets up culture for a dictator. This happened with Mao. This happened with every dictator that's come about. Because as long as everyone does what's right in their own eyes, chaos ensues. When chaos ensues, everybody's longing for a, a man of peace to take control. You see that? Okay, so if everyone does what's right in his own eyes, if Cody comes onto my property and takes something, right? It's like a rake, so it wouldn't be like a lot to steal. But if I came over to Cody's house, I'd be like, that's an amazing tractor. I'm just going to take this awesome mower because I need one. And then the next guy steals, and the next guy steals, and the next guy steals. Pretty soon, everybody on the street's mad. You guys with me? When relativism is at the core of a society, the book of Judges says it like this, when everyone does what's right in their own eyes, okay, chaos ensues. When chaos ensues, everybody's going, we need a, we need a leader. You see what I mean? And so that sets the stage for the Antichrist, for the man of lawlessness. But who do we know? We know is the ultimate peace is Jesus. Amen? Okay. So again, I want to say this. Those who have encountered the truth of God don't claim to be deserving of that encounter, but rather we are humbled by it. I want to take you to the shepherds. When I think about, I was like, Lord, connect this to the Christmas story. I want to bring the, bring the, the focus back to the Christmas story. He reminded me of the shepherds. Who were the shepherds and why did God reveal an amazing message to shepherds? Some of the lowest in society, but Jesus wanted them to hear the good news. Aren't you so glad that the good news of the gospel is not for the elite for just the Ivy League educated, that the good news is for you. Why don't you just be a little snarky and turn to your friend and say, even you, turn to your neighbor, even you. Imagine being a shepherd that night. Scholars say in Galilee it got really cold. Imagine you're around the fire and suddenly you are blinded by a huge light. And a sound of hundreds of angels singing. How many of you guys think you'd be a little bit shocked? How many of you guys realize that was not on the planner for the day? They didn't open their planner, right? And be like, three o'clock, angel visit, got it. They were completely surprised. But why did God show up to, to, to shepherds, okay? It turns out that like all the heroes of our faith, are shepherds. Isn't this wild? Look at this. Abraham, the man God chose to be the father of our faith. Shepherd. Moses, who did God choose to bring the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt? A man named Moses. Although he grew up in Pharaoh's house, when he escaped after murdering one of the Egyptians, he became a, guessed it, shepherd. David, surely the next hero of our faith would have a different occupation. Don't you love these threads in the Bible? It's so cool. Who is David? A political uh, leader? Yes, yes, he becomes king, but who is he first? Shepherd. Right? God always chose shepherds to lead his people. God chooses leaders who care individually for those people, the followers, who have a genuine love. All right? Number three, Jesus is that light, that good shepherd, the one who loves us and cares enough to reveal truth to us, truth in the midst of a dark world. <laughs> I wish I would have grabbed a video that just popped in my mind that I saw a couple months ago. Has anybody seen the, the reel of the shepherd who, who, who rescues the sheep and then there's a little meme right there, and it says, this is me, this is Jesus. And the sheep jumps right back into the cave. <laughs> Have anybody seen that? And the shepherd's just like, oh. <laughs> That's us. And Jesus keeps coming back to us. Aren't you so thankful that Jesus comes back to you? Even with your questioning and even with your wondering, he always comes looking for you. And what you need to know is that the world is getting darker and darker and darker. 
And Jesus is the only truth, not only that makes sense, not only that sets you free, but the only truth that gives you actual peace in your heart. Peace that tells you, a hope that tells you right here that you're going somewhere. Amen? Amen. She, she said amen too. Amen, sister. All right, number four. The truth of Jesus lasts far beyond the acceptance of any person or social group. Now, why do I say that? Because at the core of every human is a need to feel accepted by a group. Right? Psychologists have pointed this out for centuries. That when you really study human behavior... We have an intrinsic need to be accepted. This is why middle school was probably very traumatic for you. Right? It was traumatic for all of us because we want to be accepted. And it's at that point in life that we realize we are our own human apart from our adults and I have to make myself fit into this world. We want to be loved. We need to be loved. We need to be affirmed and we need to be valued. But I want to tell you, it's only Jesus that can give you that love that you're striving for. Look at Matthew chapter 1. How do I know this? Why did Jesus, what did God call Jesus when he shows up to Joseph? Look at this. Angel of the Lord visits Joseph. Now let's pause before we read this. I know you guys are going to hear the whole story on Christmas Eve, but for those of you who might be guests, I want to just tell you, Joseph, he isn't buying it, right? His fiance is like... I'm pregnant. It's God. Anybody else that'd be hard to believe? Just me and Ray? <laughs> that was the scene, okay? I'm pregnant. Joseph's like, it wasn't me. Right? And she's like, it's God. Now, he doesn't know whether to laugh or to be angry <laughs> or to throw something, right? You got to take yourself there. You got to really put yourself into the story. He's, he's confused. He's mad. So God, in his mercy, sends an angel to, to show up, which, by the way, that's so cool. Because if, if I'm Joseph, I'm, I'm going to need an angel myself. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't, even, don't send me an email. I want an angel. So an angel shows up, okay? An angel shows up and says, hey, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary what God has conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And then he said, are you sure? No, he didn't. Okay. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, a virgin will become pregnant, give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which translated is that God is with us. I want to reiterate we have an intrinsic need to be with. Have you guys ever seen some of the documentaries of the, the babies who are, who are born, sometimes orphaned in particular, in Asia, Asian countries who are only, were only allowed one child, and then they're, they're left, and without human interaction, right? It's really detrimental. We're born to be with. We're born to be with in, in, in community. But more than that, Please hear me. You are born to be with God. That's what made Eden, Eden. The Garden of Eden, that you are with God. Ever say this with me. With God. One more time. With God. So when God looks down on humanity and he sees their frustration, and he sees their hurts, he sees their questions, after 400 years of silence, he sends Jesus... Not to yell from the clouds, but to come down and be right there with us, flesh and bone, eye to eye. I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine being Simon Peter when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And he realizes that this is the Son of God. And so he says, you're Messiah, the Son of God. And I love what the Father, I love what Jesus says, the Father has revealed this to you. You didn't come to this conclusion on your own merit. At the core of who we are is a, not just a desire, church, 
It's a need to be with God. And Jesus makes that possible. Let me say that again. Put your hand right here on your heart. At the core of who you are, whether you're a guest with me today or whether I've known you for 20 years, please hear me. At the core of who you are is a need to be with God. And Jesus makes that possible. God sent Jesus to be Emmanuel. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. We can't have that unless we admit, unless we repent of our sin. And that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where a lot of people say, I'm not, no, see, I'm, I'm actually a good person. And we've confused what good is. Good is not your version of right. Let me say that again. Good is not your version of what's right. Good is God. God is truth. He embodies truth. That's why I love the way John says it in the first chapter. He says, Jesus came from the Father in truth and love. He is the embodiment of truth. And so if you want to know God and if you want to know truth, it takes admitting that you have a lack of truth. It takes admitting that you need to repent of your sin. Look at Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to close with this. Jesus saw a crowd around him. He gave orders to the other side. A scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, Foxes have holes and birds have uh, nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple came to him and said, First, let me go bury my father. Jesus said, follow me and leave the dead to bury their dead. Now, why do I say that? That's, that sounds like such a harsh, that's not a verse that most pastors maybe just going to throw into a Sunday sermon. But here's why I brought that one up. Because until you realize how much Jesus embodies truth, the words of Jesus will appear harsh to you. How many of you guys have ever read the Bible and it just seemed harsh? Has it, it's happened to me. Has anyone ever read the Bible and be like, you know, well, God, you've offended me. You know? But then when I stop and I take a deep breath and I realize I'm not God, God is God. And I'm subjecting myself to his authority. After all, that's why I'm reading the word, right? Then I realize if I'm offended, I'm the one that I have to change. I have to change by this scripture. So is Jesus being too harsh by saying that? No, it, he has incredible compassion. He cries with the woman. This is, a, this is a scene when someone has lost their relative. He cries, right, with Mary and Martha at the death of Lazarus. The woman named, who comes out of Nain, right, and there's this resurrection miracle, he cries. He has empathy. It's not that Jesus is lacking empathy. It's that in this point, he's proving that he is so supremely true that he is your family. This is why even on the cross, this is why even on the cross, right, or rather it's right before he goes to the cross. I think it's right before, right on the cross. He says, but who is my family? Those who do my will. This is why, like, I, I could have, how do I say this? When you realize the truth of who Jesus is, Jesus becomes thicker than blood. Your family. He becomes literally your, Jesus becomes your brother and his father is your father. Amen? I hope that makes sense to you. I want to put a song on as we close this service that we're just going to play from the sound system. As they play this, I want you to hear this. All that you see around you is going to pass away. And the Bible says that the truth remains. That only the truth remains. 
And so if you're listening online or you're, maybe you're a guest with me today and you've thought, well, okay, that's good for you, but for me, you know, my truth, my world is that I'm going to do X, Y, Z. I need, to un- I need you to understand, what if you're right? Sure. What if you're wrong? What if you stand before Jesus? What if you stand before Jesus? What if the rapture happens today? What if you become ill and you go to meet God? When you stand before him, trust me, you will realize that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That there is no other way. There is no side entrance to heaven. There's one gate. Amen? I want you to bow your heads. I want to invite you today to repent of your sin. Admit your need for God to save you. If today you're here and you say, I've never given my heart to Jesus, I want to ask you right now to bow your head and admit that Jesus died on the cross so that you could be forgiven and you could know his father, that his father would be your father. I'm not going to invite you up to the front. I want you to just right there respond where you are. If you know in your heart, your heart of hearts, you say, look, I've been attending church, but I haven't accepted the truth that I'm a sinner needing to be saved. If that's you and you want to be saved, would you raise your hand nice and high? This is not if you want to do better in life. This is not a prosperity gospel. God's going to solve all your problems. This is do you want to admit your need for God? If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? I'm going to pray with you. Jesus. We love you, Lord. Can we actually... um, I wonder, do we have the lyrics for this? Will we be able to put, okay. Can we all stand up? Let's end with worship. Sing this if you know this. And we'll raise the volume real high, yeah. Let's just end with worship. And renew my mind. Never leave me alone. Come on, let's talk about our need for him right now. I need you. Save me. Come save me. Heal my hurting heart, God. Come heal me. Father, forgive me. For I ignored the truth. And this is why he tells us, because he loves us. You love me so you tell me what's keeping me from you Father forgive me I ignore maybe you're saved but there's some areas of your life you compromised give it to God right now love me so you tell me what's keeping Give that sin to Jesus. I don't want this anymore. Take this sin away, my Lord. I don't want this anymore. Take this sin away, my Lord. So, Jesus, we thank you that you us enough to point out the areas of our life that's keeping us from friendship with you. I, again, I just want, I want to close this service with this, that you might be here and you, you are saved, you love Jesus, but if there's areas of your life, church, that you've been compromising, can I just invite you, it's not worth it. It is not worth it for you to lose 
nearness with Emmanuel. Can you guys just say the name Emmanuel? He is holy and he wants to be near you and with you. And if you're a child of God, but you're entertaining sin, you will not have the friendship with God that you were designed for. I want to say that again. You won't have the friendship with God that you're designed for. It, and it's just not worth it. So God, we love you. I know that right now I can just feel it, that you are sending loving messages of conviction all throughout this building. God, thank you for the healthy tears of repentance. Thank you for what Paul ca calls godly sorrow. That God, as I looked out, I saw many tears. Thank you for repentance. Thank you for the gift of repentance that we can just be honest with you and you forgive us. Your mercy truly is great, God. There's been so many times, Jesus, that you were slow to anger and abounding in love. We love you. If you're thankful for grace, say amen. Amen. God is such a good God. Amen. Man, why don't you high five a couple people, give them a big fat hug and a high five. I guess just overwhelm them with the fact.